Welcome to Buddha the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and my guest this week is Sharon Landreth. Welcome, Sharon. Yeah, thank you. I yeah. really appreciate this opportunity. Yeah, and apologies to those who have come to my site over the last two days and discovered that it, it, the site was down. Um, this thing has become so popular that it turned out I was completely compromising the performance of every other website on the on the server that that batgap.com was sharing and so they shut me off without notice and shut the whole thing down and so it's been a two-day scramble with a friend in India to get everything moved over to a new server so that batgap.com is up and running again how wonderful yeah. can i ask you a question yes what uh what's what inspired you to do this well, I was out in the garage working out on my Bowflex machine, listening to Adyashanti, and <laughs> and this little bubble came up in my mind that I'd do an interview show, and um, I I first conceived of doing it as a radio show on my local radio station, which has like about a ten mile radius, and for some reason they were resisting it, you know? <laughs> and I bugged them for a couple of months, and I couldn't talk them into it. It seemed like such a good idea, and finally I thought, all right, let's make it a TV thing, and and so I went to the local public access TV station and started taping them there, but they never had their act together and and. and to actually air the things in, locally, so I thought, well, why not just put it on the internet? You know, why why go for such a small audience anyway? So I Absolutely. I moved it to the internet, and then it's just kind of blossomed from there. Well, wonderful. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a great service. Yeah, thank you. I'm having a lot of fun with it. I like the questions that you ask. Good. You saw. I They're take it. I take it. You've listened to a few of these. I have. Good. I listened to Odges. And um, I listen to Joy Sharp. Mm -hmm. I'm not a real internet person. I'm one of the, you know, old folks, I guess. But yeah. um, I've, you know, it's it's an inc an amazing tool. I do mm. recognize that. Yeah, you know. But what? I liked your your questions are unique. Is what I was trying to say. Oh, good. Um, what I find handy is I have a little iPod, you know, and I put everything on that, and then I can listen while I'm riding my bicycle or taking a walk or something, and, and so, so I don't have to sit at the computer so much. Yeah. So I highly recommend that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll um, tell that to my husband. Yeah, tell him to give you an iPod <laughs> for your birthday. Well, I met him. He's on it for hours and hours and hours, you know. Oh, I see. And right. Totally immersed. Totally happy, you know. Yeah. But um, well, me too, but too much, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you know, kind of computer zombie. Let me read a little um, uh, bio that I have of you here, which I think is from your website, and uh, so so as to give people an introduction to you. Um, Sharon is a gifted intuitive and a spiritual teacher in the lineage of Adya Shanti. I wonder if Adya would say that he has a lineage. I guess he would. <laughs> Sharon has a devotion and great love of truth. Adya Shanti asked her to teach in 2003 and guide those genuinely drawn to the path of truth. Since then, Sharon continues to deepen into and embody this truth herself. She always invites you to come home to that which you've always been. Um, bean, bin, potato, potato, I don't know. Um, Are you from Canada? <laughs> no, I'm from Connecticut. But from, uh, <laughs> they say bean. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I'm kind of a hybrid, I guess. <laughs> so there's a bit more here. In her presence, you'll taste a palpable expression of love and intimacy that allows you to feel safe, dropping into the deep vulnerability required to know yourself as the all. Sharon offers support for the required shift of identity that is both direct and tailored to each person's journey. Her teachings are based on her deep realization of silence and the way silence expresses itself in form. She notes, often there is still a thread that says, the me is going to get it, the me <laughs> is going to wake up, and it just isn't true. It actually wakes up out of the me. So in her teaching, Sharon emphasizes how silence wakes up in the body and how the embodiment process is actualized. She is well qualified in this endeavor by her many years as an intuitive counselor. Since she has the ability to read the physical and energetic body, she is uniquely able to help unlock patterns that inhibit realization and the embodiment process that follows. Okay, so that's a rather dry way of introducing you. I'm sure you could have said all that yourself spontaneously, but that, that gets it in a nutshell for us. Got that over with? Yeah. <laughs> 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 so generally in these interviews, as you know, since you've listened to them, um, there's there's kind of a balance between um, telling one's personal story, which can sometimes be very interesting, 
and you know how one came to what this realization and people can relate to that they oh darn you know that's that I can relate to that that's like me and oh maybe there's hope for me too and, that and can be helpful. yeah and then also just expounding whatever knowledge one is inclined to expound which may have nothing to do with any sort of personal story so we can explore all that we have plenty of time well you know I'm open to where you want to go mm -hmm. but the um, what I was really interested in and um, I heard you ask some questions and I talked with Joy pretty extensively about your conversation as well mm -hmm. and uh, You're referring to Joy Sharp, whom people can find if on batgap.com if they want to listen to that one. Yeah. Yeah, we we talk on the phone. You know, we're both from Colorado and right. enjoy we talk together. Mm -hmm. And you know that question, um, and I'm more than welcome to share whatever you want to ask and whatever you've prepared. Mm -hmm. But my question is, you know, we're starting to be in whatever you want to call this, this sort of more direct way. Of recognition um, we're getting a little bit of maturity you know I've been with my teacher for 11 years and so I've had the great privilege of watching um, a master 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 teacher Aja, and, you mean. Aja right. and the and the Sangha mm -hmm. that so you get to see this sort of large group of of, of beings I guess my question is we we've you know most of us um, the seeking has pretty much stopped mm -hmm. um, the kind of romanticism of it all is pretty much seen through um, there's this very large group of people that are either have had the essential shift or they and so the abidance is happening you know, in a continuous way, it doesn't come and go. And there are many, 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 many more who've had this very deep glimpse and taste, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's still the coming and the going. So we're getting to observe how is this lived and how is this expressed. And um, I'm sure you're aware of it because you probably are watching. There's teachers like Jeff Foster, for instance, that is just saying, I am not non-dual. I am not Buddhist. I am not right, and so and then there's this non-dual camp that's like there's nobody there and there's nothing there and da 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 da, -da and, and all you have to do is just wake up and everything happens automatically. And then there's this other camp that you know it's it's all just happening and I'm everything. And so you know you know what I'm trying to say. Absolutely, we're, yeah. we're coming into this beautiful place of maturity to literally look around and see if this is actually being lived mm -hmm. rather than conceptualized or rather than still breaking off into these different camps that that's happened for thousands of years mm -hmm. so is it possible for us to come into this kind of freshness this hasn't happened before as far as we can tell mm -hmm. historically not this number yeah not not, th not, not this, this number not this collective. So, you know, I'm interested at this point of, you know, how is this lived? How is this fresh and new? Mm -hmm. And and how do we move out of these ideas and concepts and camps and, you know, the division within the non-dual, right? Yeah. So no, that, that's very much, all, all you just said is very much a hot topic for me. And, you know, I've been pondering this week after week and bringing these points up to people that I interview and um, I read a beautiful article by Timothy Conway uh, recently I don't know if you know Timothy but he broke the whole thing down very nicely with reference to sort of ancient traditions and so on and in terms of there being you know three very well he, he could be somewhat arbitrary the subdivisions but he he defined you know first of all the obvious level of life where we appear to have free will and we have responsibilities and obligations and we might be fervently um, engaged in some kind of good works so, you know helping children or animals or whatever we do environment and yeah. uh, then there's uh, and there's another level deeper level maybe where it's all sort of divine and, and everything is perfect just as it is and everything is sort of divinely orchestrated and and so on and then there's a, perhaps even a more fundamental level uh, where you know it's all unmanifest it's absolute nothing ever happened 
Uh, right. There are no animals or children or trees or anything else. It's all just pure, unmanifest soup. And physics, you know, gives us a structure very similar to that. And, right. you know, his argument in this article, which I think really resonated with me, is that if you take a stance in any one of these things, you kind of miss the whole picture. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's like, even though they're paradoxically different from one another, each has its own integrity and the rules of one don't necessarily apply to the other. And Absolutely. full realization involves learning to embody it all and embrace it all and simultaneously dwell on all those levels. And of course, right, it's, it's, it's that open, silent awareness that permeates it all. Exactly. That is the one constant, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and that isn't really often being, I mean, it's pointed out in the teachings, but it's very rarely do I see that it's actually being recognized and, and lived. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just the tendency of the mind. Yeah. Right? And that open silence awareness doesn't negate any, any of those it other things. It negates nothing. You, know, you can't say just because it's all open silent awareness, you don't have to do this, that, or the other thing. Oh, it's absolutely. Like, yeah. But, that, yeah. but a lot of voices still say that. They, they do. And, and I think it's an exciting time right now, and you really get this big, you know, view of different voices, but I think it's a very exciting time is that we're really starting to explore that and look at that and maybe take that apart, and that these old divisions and camps of, you know, I'm the empty or I'm the full, it, it no longer is holding much water. And yeah. of course, there's still this battle happening, and it will continue because, you know, it's the way of the mind. Mm -hmm. But I find it a very wonderful time that we're really looking at it as a consciousness. We're yeah. starting to ask questions about it. Yeah, when you say the way of the mind, I mean, I find myself doing it. it there's a human tendency to kind of glom on to a particular perspective. Sure. And then right. you catch yourself. You say, okay, yeah, that's part of it. But it, yeah. I'm, j I'm just feeling part of the elephant here. The, the elephant is much more than my, <laughs> yeah. my perspective on it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, you know, let's just keep coming back to that that is awake throughout it all, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's nothing that it's not awake in. There's nothing that it's not actually is arising from it, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I have this there's, friend who's, I'm sorry, go ahead. There's no exception, I guess right. is what I'm trying to say. I have this friend who says, well, you're being wishy-washy, you know? You don't seem to be taking a stance, um, <laughs> you know, because you agree with everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and my answer is, yeah, I agree with everybody, but there's always a yes, but, you know, yeah. fine, you know, you've got it, but it's like, <laughs> you know, that guy in uh, Fiddler on the Roof, he would always say, on the other hand. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and that's, the, it's, that's the paradox, right? It's just like, there's only this. Period, right. end of story, there's nothing else. The mm -hmm. absolute. Mm -hmm. And yet... Yeah, yes, but. Yes, but. Yeah. And. Right? And that's not a new understanding. I mean, traditional Advaita is not the plain vanilla, absolute only, you know, everybody else can take a hike uh, perspective. It's actually very inclusive and embracing. And, and Vedanta actually means end of the Veda, but the Vedantists didn't say the rest of the Veda is bunk. They just said, all right, well, from this perspective, that's the, it's, it's the totality, but all those other things have relevance if you're you know, at this or that or the other stage of your progress. Mm -hmm. Well, there's been some misunderstanding around that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but again, you know, that's the way it is. Look what happened to Jesus' teachings. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> that's the thing. I mean, well, there's the, my the teacher that I followed for many years. Always, he always used to say, "Knowledge crumbles on the hard rocks of ignorance." And um, and he also used to s say that you know one can only listen from one's own level of consciousness or one owns one's own perspective. And if that's that true. if that doesn't sort of if that's not the same as the level from which something is being spoken, then there's inevitably going to be a misunderstanding or a partial understanding. That's the truth. I you know, here there was like a phase that I went through, my personality has kind of an idealistic bent to it. Mm -hmm. And so I started to look around and began to see the interpretations and the arrogance and the, um, you know, the, the co-opting of 
um, what actually was this fresh and constantly renewing truth. Um, and so the reaction then was judgmental and righteous. Your and reaction, you mean? My reaction. Uh -huh. So I got to, to be with that. Mm. And when I began to just let that be and see through it, then I began to see the innocence of it all, that it, it just can come, like you said so beautifully, or like your teacher said. Mm -hmm. It can only come from what this mind allows in. Mm -hmm. And the only antidote, of course, is to just open up and yeah. relax all of that. Mm -hmm. And then it's all present, right? Yeah. But that um, judgment and arrogance that was here had to be seen through before then the open sort of acceptance of actually it's all innocent took place. And that's not always easy for, quote, a teacher. Because the teacher's the grounding. I mean, it's, it's like the, uh, what's that, the, the lightning rod mm. for everyone's ideas and projections to be landed on. Yeah. And you just become accustomed to that. It's mm. a great fire. It's a great fire. Have you done quite a bit of teaching now? Um, yeah, I have. Um, you know, it's, I, uh, you live in the Midwest, so you probably kind of understand this. Um, I came from the Midwest, and um, my husband and I were still living um, there when Ajit asked me to teach. Mm -hmm. So I just began to teach there. You were in Kansas or someplace? I was in Kansas, uh-huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So... Um, most of the traditions were in that area and had been for a long time. The Zen tradition had been in, especially the university areas, for maybe 30 years, you know, or more. Um, all the different traditions were there, except the non-dual. Mm. So I just sort of naively and, you know, maybe stupidly, I just sort of stepped out and started to meet with people and they started to ask me you know in different places and there you know there was somewhat of a response but um, then when I moved to Colorado and I started to go to Boulder which is a quite sophisticated spiritual community mm -hmm. and I started to teach um, here in Crestone which again is a quite sophisticated spiritual community and so it, it was very um, slow in a certain kind of way, quite gradual. Um, my tendency or interest is more in this more of an intimate, smaller um, kind of sangha. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's what we've emphasized. And um, that kind of remains. And I'm, I'm quite fine with that. Mm. Um, I'd rather, I think, work quite deeply with people, quite intimately and then see a depth and a maturity happen. Um, and um, so, yeah, I teach a lot, but um, it's, it's a fairly small, 20, 25 in there somewhere. Good. And um, I like that. Actually, I got an email from someone who went to a retreat with you and uh, Joy Sharp up in Boulder. And um, he, uh, he said he mentioned to you on a couple of that on a couple of my interviews with various people, the question had come up of whether or not one can awaken without a teacher. And he said, I'd like you to bring this up with Sharon. Uh -huh. um, and uh, she said, he said, your response was yes, but the embodiment needs a guide. And he, he wanted that shared with a larger audience. That's how it appears here. Yeah. Because, you know, from what I've observed, and in fact, um, a lot of the emphasis is taken off of um, trying to sort of, I don't know, uh, support that essential shift of identity, waking up. Because what I've observed over this last, you know, eight years or more that I've observed um, so many people throughout the world, really, um, it happens in its own unique way. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it happens with the teacher. What I'm running into a lot is uh, people in the middle of nowhere. And if there's some transparency that is present, your, your natural state will just shine through in its own way. So 
that seems to, I mean, you can set up certain circumstances for sure. And you can be with someone, you know, someone like Aja, that the, the teaching is so precise and so clear, and the transmission is profound, mm. right? Everything is there with him. Mm -hmm. So that's the perfect circumstance that that can happen. But what I found is, you know, it happens regardless. It just happens regardless. But the embodiment is, it's, there's a lot of confusion and a lot of co-opting and a lot of grasping and a lot of, you know, like we were just started our conversation. You know, you, you grab what worked for you and that's the truth and everything else is denied, right? Yeah. So there's a lot of confusion there. So I think it's probably vital, actually. Let's, uh, let's explore both of these things in depth. Um, you mentioned earlier, you know, that you use the term essential shift, and you define that in terms of abidance. Um, and of course, the term awakening gets thrown around a lot, and the term enlightenment gets thrown around a lot. So right. let's, um, let's give everybody a clear understanding of what you mean by essential shift and abidance, and if you wish, also uh, awakening and, and in enlightenment, if you, if you dis distinguish between those terms. Yeah, I think that's helpful. You know, I'll give uh, an example here. Mm -hmm. um, there, even as a child, there had been, do you have a cat? Yeah, she wants to go out. I'm just <laughs> letting her out here. There you go. <laughs> she comes and goes. You'll like see that. me opening this door you're off. A, like... Yeah, you're right. You're the, ser <laughs> you're the servant, right? right. I'll, I'll do whatever you want, honey. I'm the gatekeeper. She w <laughs> This morning, she woke me up at 3 in the morning wanted food, wanting food, so I fed her, and then I went you and meditated got up and for a while. Her, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My wife says I'm giving her bad habits, but I think it's too late. <laughs> Yeah, you might as well just go with it. <laughs> <laughs> it's too painful otherwise. Yeah. Um, so here, there was many different glimpses, I call them that, over and over and over and over and over and over. As a child, um, when I began to meditate, um, um, I kind of went along with all of the techniques that were taught, but really the reason why I sit silently in retreats, and I was quite aligned with retreats and did them for many, many, many years, was if I just sit silently, something came and woke up, right? It happened quite automatically. Mm -hmm. And that's what that I was after. But the lament of the seeker, it came and it went. And there was still the idea that either it was something outside that came in or the me, the personality, had to do something in order for this to happen. So that hung on for a long, 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 long time. And the classic Buddhist teachings, I don't think it was Buddhist teachings, Buddha's teachings, but the Buddhist teachings kind of supported that. Right, you had to do certain things. You had to do this. This had to happen. Da 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 da. And probably this is never going to happen in your lifetime. Mm. Right, the Tibetans were the only ones that gave you any hope. <laughs> <laughs> and then it was so intense, you know, you could yeah. never probably do it, you know. But when that essential shift happened, and it happened quite spontaneously, quite profoundly, and quite powerfully and that isn't the way it always goes right. there's kind of what they call that melting quality that it just kind of wears out mm -hmm. well mine was many 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 glimpses over a long period of time um, but the coming and the going was was quite constant to um, it I just woke up mm -hmm. was out of the dream I saw this character called Sharon sitting there. I realized what, you know, the first thought that came when thoughts started to move a little bit was all the teachers were right. There is no way ever that this me is ever going to get it. It's not designed to do so. It can't. And you just don't give that up until some grace happens and you pop out of it. So it was here, and I'm not saying this is true for everyone, 
there was this essential shift of identity. And it never went back. It never went back. And when you say the me isn't going to get it, would it, would a fair way of describing that be to say that, you know, the it we're referring to is something so much vaster than the me that we're referring to that that the, the latter obviously cannot contain the former. It's it's not like some enti some entity or accomplishment or object that one gets. It's it's a, you know this vast field of awareness wake wakes up to itself and right. Yeah. It's a it's a letting go. Right. Right. Because the identity is collapsed into this, like you said beautifully, it's collapsed into this little tiny point called me. Yeah, the ocean and, is somehow squeezed into a drop, and then all of a sudden, exactly, and all that's of a sudden, it. Then, then it's shifted around. It's the drop <laughs> within the ocean, rather than vice versa. Exactly. <laughs> so that when that happens, and again, it's it's total grace. It's mm -hmm. different for everyone. Um, then, no matter what was flushed up and here um, it uh, whatever you want to call it I call it the embodiment it's that you know you you come up out of the me mm -hmm. and for some that lasts a long long time for others it's a few moments and here it um, um, that recognition that that shift of perspective never changed it never went back but almost immediately, I mean, I went back to the Midwest. Um, um, I was having Christmas for my family. I was doing this whole kid grandmother thing. And it was like, whoa, you know, what is this? <laughs> <You know? laughs> and almost immediately, this deep flushing, the embodiment, what it was not started to pour out. And for probably about six months, it was a wild ride. I mean, wild. You know, where I would be dropping into the void where there was absolutely nothing, nobody. And then the next moment, there would be this rage or there would be this, you know, confusion of the mind had completely disconnected for a period of time. It was like something had cut the wires. And the mind was over here going, ah, 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 and it had no connection to what was actually expressing itself. None. So it was very strange. And it was very early on with Aja's Sangha. And I, it wasn't that he probably didn't talk about it, but again, I didn't have the ears to hear it. And um, he already, I think, had maybe two or three teachers set up, but, you know, I was sort of not connected to that. Um, I tried to talk to my friends who'd had a very long spiritual practice, if this was any of their uh, um, experience, and they had no idea what I was talking about. They thought I'd kind of like little crackers. So I just shut up because something knew itself and something knew exactly what was happening, and something knew that wisdom was, was moving. So I just wrote it out, and it was wild. And then I went back when we had a retreat in California, my husband and I, and um, I just, first time I could ask a question, I was up there, and I said, what is happening here? And um, then he explained in this very clear and beautiful way of what really was going on. So I guess what I'm trying to say, it was a whole different world. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like this better person, more spiritual, awake, more calm, more da 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 da, -da at all. It was like I had stepped out of this, and I'd been a very long time spiritual person. I'd had thousands and thousands of experience for all of my life to this. Yeah. And that was it. So no matter what came up, um, the awareness was prominent. It was never overshadowed. There was never a second that there was a feeling of any coming and going from then on. So my sense is that that's a vital thing to recognize. And it isn't like comparing to how it works for someone else, but it's really to, to, to hear all the way through 
that it's you're stepping into a different functioning. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and in his books, Adya talks about you know shifts like yours, which are dramatic and abrupt, and then the more kind of gradual ones, which right. are so incremental that one might yeah. not even notice that they've occurred. Yeah. You know, that and, is true. Yeah. and I'm seeing more of that actually, mm-hmm. and less of those really dramatic ones. Yeah, but they, it's the whole gamut. You know, it, uh, every po- and everyone is slightly different, you know, but there, there are certain, certain categories, I guess, we could put them into. But, you know, my sense, and the re- only reason why I brought that up was because I think, you know, again, if you look at it, the collective is, this is more in the collective. This is more recognized than it was 11 years ago. Even. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, these days, you know, people who are having awakenings like yours have plenty of places to turn to, to, you know, find that, kindred, kindred souls and teachers and whatnot. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And because there's a lightning in the collective, right, mm-hmm. that um, I think that sort of gradual thing is much more prevalent than it used to be. Mm. Right? And sudden things, too. I mean, I had this... Uh, young woman get in touch with me recently you know who living a very kind of ordinary life not into spiritual things and yeah. she had this kundalini awakening start yeah. happening and, and she yeah. didn't know what the heck it was and i mean she's you know a very down-to-earth person smoking cigarettes and you know, yeah. li- living a normal life yeah. and this and then she she needed help and so i kind of like connected her with um it was one friend who's been through that whole thing and then then she actually got in on Adya's recent phone call and asked him a question and then after that the whole thing kind of settled down and yes. she's, she's sort yeah. of on the other side of it now you know yeah it's happening faster i think yeah. it's it's happening easier um and like i said before i talk to people all over the united states and you know, they can be a cowboy in Wyoming, mm-hmm. I mean, an art teacher, you know, he never heard of anything. And he receives Diksha over the phone and he totally wakes up. Yeah. Right? Fascinating. It is fascinating. It, I think it's extraordinarily fascinating. It so, sort of gives you hope, you know, for where the world might be headed. It gives you hope. And also what I'm seeing are these young people. And they're about, you know, maybe... 16 to 25 Mm -hmm. and they are just waking up like that all over Mm. and I mean in the middle of Kansas in the middle of Wyoming I don't care where Mm -hmm. and wherever I go there'll be someone in the audience and they'll come up and they say I know exactly what you're talking about this happened for me but what I think is so wonderful about the younger generation is that they aren't kind of pulling back People from my generation, when that would happen, there was this tendency to kind of pull out, you know, a little bit. I think it was our training. And they're just like, okay, I'm in life. I'm going to have kids. I'm going to get married. I'm, right. I'm, I'm in it. Mm-hmm. And it isn't even special in some ways, right? Yeah. It's just they go, oh, here I am. So my sense is that's the real hope mm. are these amazing young people. Maybe the times were such when we were that age or a little older and going through stuff that we needed to kind of pull back a little bit because maybe the I'm just this is just a theory which you can feel free to shoot down but may, you know maybe we needed every little bit of help we could get but now it's more conducive to it and I, it's, I think it, there's truth to that for I sure I mean you know I mean so yeah. so many so many ages people have run away to monasteries and ashrams and stuff yeah. to, to get into a more conducive atmosphere. Right. And now, as you say, you can just be in the thick of it and having the same realization. Yeah, yeah, w- I think that's true. Hence the title of this show. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly, yeah. perfect. Yeah. So, you know, you, we kind of got off of your question a little bit. So that essential shift, if it's gradual or if it's sudden and dramatic, that has to happen. Mm-hmm. And maybe it's a split second, and maybe you know it's over a period of time. I don't, I don't know. But I watch a lot of people that have glimpses, and then they claim that this is an awakening. Yeah, not true. I was just going to ask you that. So, would you say that post shift, the quality or nature of what is being lived is very different from? the sort of on again off again phase that you went through it's, it's, it's so in other words it's, totally it's, not, ju- it's not just this, the on again phase permanently but it's actually of a whole different character that was my experience yeah. that's all I can share that was my experience 
That was my experience. Even though there was a period of time and it still somewhat happens because that, that monitor's gone. Mm -hmm. And um, so your life looks anything but enlightened. To the right. observer or to, even the obs to yourself? To the observer. To the observer, sure, yeah, because you're the same old schmo you always were. You know? Just... <laughs> or neurotic. Yeah. Stuff that was hidden mm. is pouring to the surface or patterns that were held down because there was a monitor mm -hmm. that compensated or, you know, kept it in the background. All of that, all that pours out. Well, that gets us to the embodiment aspect of the question, um, and it's interesting the way it happened for you. I think maybe for the for the incremental people, yeah. uh, the the <laughs> shit doesn't hit the fan to the same extent, you know, <laughs> because they're true. they're kind of working it out by degrees as they go along. Uh, but if the if the shift is sudden, then the the necessary adjustment can be more intense, is from what I observe anyway. I, I think that's uh, accurate. Um, and here, you know, it wasn't like I didn't work anything out before. Right, right, right. I'd spent about 30 years <laughs> with everything down the, from body work to, you know, long meditation retreats to, you know, the works. Mm -hmm. And, you know, perhaps this was just a heavy karmic, you know, load. I don't know. I yeah. stopped thinking and comparing it. But, um, yeah, I think you're right. I think it's less dramatic. I mean, yeah. here it was like an explosion for about six months. Mm. Well, you know, I'm uh, very much of the mind that there's a uh, that the, our human apparatus is a it's like an instrument that enables this to be lived, and yeah. and yeah, you know, and, and, and that's why spiritual practice that's what the purpose of spiritual practice is is to kind yeah. of fine fine tune the instrument and make it a more suitable reflector or receptacle or whatever. Yes. And uh, but if there's a big shift one way or the other, uh, it can the other, you know, if you, if you yank one leg of the table, the other leg's got to come along. So if there's a big, huge shift in consciousness, as you experienced, then the physiology says, wait a minute, I got to catch up with this, you know, because yeah. it has to sort of function in an entirely different way to really properly yeah. sustain what is being experienced. And there may be a lot of adjustment that's necessary for that to really get established. It's, it's a beautiful way of describing it. That that was my experience because it was energetic, it was mental, it was emotional, it was physical, the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. Did you do anything in particular during that period to facilitate the changes and adjustments that needed to take place? <laughs> Aside from just berate your husband or whatever you did? <laughs> <laughs> that didn't last very long because, I, you know, here he was with me through our whole journey you know mm -hmm. Jean yeah. Klein was our teacher before Raja mm -hmm. and uh, we had a lot of Buddhist background and you know it was part of what brought us together and so I'd say you know this is what's happening I mean do you hear what's happening and he'd just go <laughs> <laughs> you're a pretty dramatic girl you know yeah. so I early on it just shut up because I realized he did not know even though his teaching was the same his teacher was the same he'd also had many deep experiences he did not know what was happening mm -hmm. so in a certain kind of way I was forced back into this so that became everything. Mm. And what helped was um, Aja had a lot of, um, at that time they were tapes. And I lived really far out. Um, and I was on, I mean, f in, I lived in a very rural area, so I drove a lot. And I listened to tapes almost as constantly as I possibly could. Mm. And that was so helpful because yeah. it kept what actually was happening in the foreground because no one around me really knew what was happening I couldn't talk to them mm. and um, so um, and I sit quite a lot if I could Sat. Uh, meditated I would right, just right. drop because it was so prominent and so brilliant that you know it didn't take much I just would drop and then there was that place of ease and well-being and all was well and mm -hmm. you know because that was that's the reality of it so those two 
were were really what helped. And the other was just I just hung on. Mm. For dear life. <laughs> 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 You know, and there's a couple of nice points there. Um, re re regarding the sitting, I mean, not only is it in vogue in some non-dual circles to sort of poo-poo meditation as being, you know, just a reinforcer of the of one's self-image or something, but it, but it's also, you know, sometimes thought that after awakening, it's unnecessary or, or superfluous. But, you know, it's interesting to note that after his awakening, Ramana Maharshi sat in caves for 26 years before he came right. out and started teaching. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and I don't know if this is true or not, but I also, I don't know if you've ever sit with Eckhart Tolle, but that that transmission of silence is unbelievably stunning. Oh, yeah. Stunning. I've, well, I've been with Maharshi Mahesh Yogi, with, with Ama. I had lunch yeah. with Adya when he came to town here because I set it up for him. And, you know, I'm very sensitive to darsh the darshan effect and it you know it's yeah. very very real and it and it really shifts your awareness totally that's yeah. the real gift i mean we can talk all we want but that's the real gift is the transmission but what i was what i had heard is he sits um in silence as silence a couple of hours a day uh, echo mm -hmm. ah. and so i guess what i'm trying to say here is that deep ground, the fundamental um, dark, the luminous ground, whatever you want to call that, mm -hmm. that's the nourisher. That's what informs. That's what, you know, everything comes home to that. And so rather than a discipline, I'm going to get up at 7 o'clock and I'm going to sit, it's more like I'm coming back unto myself in this totally deep and non-distracted way. Mm -hmm. And each time, there's a nourishing and kind of a flourishing. Yeah. And an uh, informing. Oh, right? Absolutely, yeah. So I think, um, again, it was a good idea because if you've had a lot of meditation background and you've hung out a lot of, you know, meditation halls, they're good meditators and they've learned the techniques really well but literally that practice has closed off what would just come through if there was a little openness hmm. right right i mean Could you be. see it you see it all the time yeah that mindfulness you know right some effort it's, individual it's, it's, effort sort of it's, keeping it's, things tight it's, exactly yeah so it was a good idea to kind of relax that mm -hmm. but then they threw the baby out with the bathwater because you know this is the this is the ground this is who it all is coming from this is who we are so to come back into that and to be renewed and you know replenished and nourished and informed yeah it's like it's like resting at home you've used the word nourished a number of times in the last couple of minutes and I, that's a really good one for me um it's like you know, pure being, absolute, whatever you want to call it, it's doing fine on its own. You know, it doesn't need anybody to do anything. But, but as far as living that is concerned, um, you know, we do have this instrument. And my my experience of meditation at this stage is just that it's extremely nourishing, and it just kind yeah. of refines and enlivens and um, just absolutely purifies, and just the whole instrument is tuned up. Yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, you know. I mean, there was, being was there long before there was a universe, presumably, uh, but now we have a universe and we have, we have beings who can live that. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and it's interesting to ponder to what extent the living of it can be um, developed. That's my curiosity is right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's my curiosity. I was... Oh, these, bo these bones are uh -huh. just as uh, awake in the absolute as the dark night sky, right? Mm -hmm. There's no difference. Mm -hmm. You know, the same wisdom, the same essence, the same consciousness, the whole thing is, is here as much as it's with, you know, the big Buddha temples and, you know, the profound chanting or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's all one thing. Yeah. yeah. Right? How glorious. Yeah. 
There so, is a, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. So living it is the only outcome. Right. And, you know, the, again, there's a, it's in vogue in certain non-dual circles to, to sort of have this on-off, black-white uh, kind of conception of awakening. Like, oh, you're awake, that's it, done. Um, but in my experience... <laughs> it's the beginning. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you just started. <laughs> and that's what I get in talking to the, the people whom I consider to be kind of a little bit more mature in all this, Adya, Muji, Gangaji, many, many others. It's yeah. like, you know, they all say... Yeah. I don't know what the end of this is. It just keeps ever deepening, ever refining, and so on. How could it, right? I mean, it's eternal, right? Mm. It's infinite. So it's impossible. Mm. Um, I know one of the great um, gifts, I mean, here, like I said, it, it, when the essential shift happened, that was just the beginning. And, you know, we're talking almost 11 years later, and I would say now it's starting to some kind of a ease and... Um, I don't know, I even know how to say it, equanimity, mm -hmm. um, being able to live somewhat, a little bit, from what one has recognized, just a little bit. Well, wasn't the equanimity there in the beginning, even though, even if all hell was breaking loose, it was, there was an underlying equanimity? There was an underlying equanimity, but the, the outer expression wasn't, right? I see, yeah. So now what Aja calls it the seamless, that that's starting to come about. And I'm a, probably a real slow learner, but that's, it took that long just for that kind of seamless, just, just really starting to, to be lived. So now you're more unflappable in the face of challenging circumstances and more equanimity on the surface, you say? Yeah. Yeah. And the, the, the connection to the outer has really relaxed. I mean, it includes the outer, mm -hmm. but there's more of an abiding, more of a, it's right here. Um, and that out and believing and then coming back and, you know, all of that has, has really relaxed. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of a much more of an ease of being. All of a sudden, those, those teaching pointers start to come in. Oh, that's what that, that actually is. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it, it certainly was not overnight. Some people, I think, that, that they're more wired that way, you know. But you have to live the cards you're dealt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we're talking about, you know, what Sharon means by an essential shift or abidance. And we're talking about embodiment. And... Uh, I think those are both very important topics, and I think it's kind of important in general that people continue to make efforts in this whole, you know, non-dual world or whatever we want to call it of uh, students and teachers and so on to clarify their terminology because there's a lot of term terms thrown yeah, around and and, there is. and people don't necessarily mean the same thing when they say awakening or or, or whatnot. I know it's it's interesting. Um, you know, I tend to use certain terms that came from my teacher, Raja, mm -hmm. because, you know, they're so clear. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I don't know how to say this. I, my sense is that just to say that there's this essential shift and then truth is prominent. Mm -hmm. And then it begins to live the life. Uh, and that's as far as the description goes. I think we, again, collectively are moving into something that really has not been fully described as of yet. And um, that may be bunk, but that's, that's my sense. Um, what appears to be happening upon the earth, and I, I know Aja doesn't talk about this at all. Um, Eckhart Tolle talks about it somewhat, and he calls it the new earth. Mm, that there's yeah. something that seems to be... Sharon, way, yes. Sharon, just lower your mic a little bit more. We're still getting a lot of... Um, a lot of breath. breath. Yeah, yeah, there you go. How about, how about that? That'll be good. Thanks, keep going. Sounds good? Yep. Is that there's this full waking up right in the midst of form, right in the midst of the earth. 
and it is including literally everything. It includes, as you say, the absolute. It includes the embodiment that seems an act of love that seems to move and come back and illuminate what has not been illuminated in the body-mind current structure. Um, and here, it seems to be coming in and totally including and consciously waking up in the body. You know, my example of the bones. Mm -hmm. Consciousness is waking up inside of the bones equally. Um, and quite recently, something seemed to open a way that had never been experienced before, which is like a kind of a, a descending mm -hmm. and including also this sharingness. Mm -hmm. Do you hear what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah I think so all the way through we've tended to say you know there is no me there is no this there is no that and that's true fundamentally mm -hmm. but my experience is that something is moving in deeper and deeper it's more of this descent and it's including this character in a very intimate way also called Sharon yeah so there's a residing in the emptiness, but something is not stopping. It's including, including, and deepening, and deepening, and deepening, and deepening. So there's a kind of an intimacy that is being experienced that has really not been touched consciously before. So I find that interesting. Aja calls it the... Um, uh, um, the virgin birth. Right, it's it's the Christ coming into waking up into four, all the way. There's uh, several interesting things in that I'd like you to expand on. Um, first of all, in terms of um, what's happening in the world at large, I suspect it's just a theory, but I suspect that there's nothing new under the sun in the sense that there have been people throughout history who've had this, you know. Oh, absolutely. As, as full and as embodied and as rich and awakening as we can imagine, but they've been such rare exceptions. That's that's why. Absolutely. I, yeah. Right. And now we're talking about some kind of collective mass awakening taking place. So that's the new thing. You know. I, I hear you. Yeah. And uh, somebody I, brought. A, I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. That's true, but I also wonder if, as the collective if there isn't something possible that perhaps has never really quite been touched. I, and I'm talking about the, the, the experience on the earth. I think you're right. Um, I think that, you know, as they say, the whole is more than the sum of its parts. And there right. has probably in our at least recorded history uh, that we know of has never been a, a whole containing so many awakened parts as there, yeah. it, as there seems to be happening now. Uh, so we're going to see the unprecedented, um, you know, ramifications yeah. of this. It it appears so. Yeah. We'll see. Uh, that's probably what Andrew Cohen is talking about with his evolutionary enlightenment thing, you know, that he writes books about and talks about all the time. I'm going to interview him in a few months and I haven't read his book yet, but he's always talking about he, how he feels that the field of spirituality itself, ooh, dog just tripped over the wire. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Good. Um, the field of spirituality <laughs> itself is, uh, is, is evolving and that we're kind of breaking fresh ground in terms of what is possible in terms of enlightenment in the whole spiritual realm. There's a sense of that here, but, mm -hmm. you know, who knows, right? Yeah. We're just all on the ride. Someone <laughs> used the analogy a while back as if, as if the sort of uh, there's a, a thick membrane that had to be pierced in order to yeah. sort of have this essential shift. And back in the day of the Buddha, the membrane was kind of tough, yeah. but it not, but he pierced it, and others have pierced it. It's beginning pierced and pierced and pierced to the point yeah. where it's kind of diaphanous now, and it's easier for others yeah. to just sort of step through without much fuss. That's my sense. That's what I've observed, and just like I was saying in the last ten years. Mm -hmm. You can really see a change just in this last 10 years. Yeah. Another thing that's exciting along these lines is if we think of uh, technology as a, as a parallel, the, the sort of exponential acceleration of it. Yeah. You know, and then if the same exponential acceleration is happening in consciousness, 
then that's thrilling, you know, to th think it's that it's, yeah. Thrilling. No one knows how it's going to be, however. No. And it's interesting <laughs> to note that there seems to also be an exponential acceleration of things on the negative side, like, you know, yes. global warming and stuff like oh, that. Absolutely. I mean, that's what the, is the interesting part, right? Mm -hmm. Is it, is it the enlightening that just like when that happens in the individual, there's that essential shift and then there's this flushing, right? Mm -hmm. Because it can no longer reside. It's being permeated by this light, right? Bright. Mm -hmm. And the sense is here anyway, that's what's happening on the earth. So when you watch the news, everything that's being brought to the surface, it's actually a great grace. It's yeah. a hard love. It's a hard grace. Right. I'm not romanticizing what's going on. But you can see that it's that same thing as what appears to happen to the individual when that enlightening starts to happen. Yeah. And here we are on this huge stage, right? It's amazing. Marishi used to say that um, the world is going to change radically one way or the other. It's inevitable. And what, yeah. he, w what he was trying to do was lubricate the process, you know, just to make it smoother yeah. by, by having yeah. people sort of change voluntarily as opposed to, you know, involuntarily. Yeah. Um, can't remember the name of the author right now, but I, um, his name, let's see, if, um, I can't bring it up, but um, the book he wrote that I was reading, rereading was called Terra Christa. Hmm. I'll think of his name in a minute. And he said that there's this uh, picture, and it's a Mormon picture, and it's showing the light of consciousness, the light of the Christ pouring through the earth. Mm -hmm. And there are those who are doing this, and then there are those who are um, going through a great deal of pain and gnashing of teeth, and you know, it's, it's a great resistance. Mm -hmm. And I thought, isn't that interesting, you know, in this Mormon painting, of really what's happening, mm. right? The resistance is creating more pain, or the opening is there's a greater grace, and both are happening. Interesting. Yeah, it okay. is, isn't it? I'm going to get Uga Booga on you for a minute here. I have this friend named Robert Cox who wrote a book called The Pillar of Celestial Fire, the, the ancient science of, I don't know, science of the ancient seers or something, but his premise was that um, he, he goes into great detail about what he calls subtle energy. And he talked mm -hmm. about how the Egyptians understood it and everything. And he, yeah. he said that because of the procession of the equinoxes, we're entering into a time when a, sort of a great blast of subtle energy is kind of coming from the center of the galaxy and yeah. irra irradiating the Earth, and that this is it going to cause so. this incredibly profound shift. Yeah. It's a fascinating book. He also talks about how it's really subtle energy, which is involved in the whole waking up of the individual human being and so on. Anyway. You know, it's sort of my, where I look, is that mm -hmm. subtle, en subtle energy, and um, y you can sense it, this, this that's pouring into the earth. Mm. And if you're clairvoyant, you can see it. Let's talk about that a little bit, because, you know, you, you, you know, according to your bio, you have this clairvoyant ability, and you can see into people's bodies, and, and that you, you've done some, I guess, intuitive healing things, and also... Tell us about that. Um, you know, it's just a fascinating um, detail. I don't know what it means. I'm the fourth generation in a line of women, and each one in the generation just was born with the ability to see. Hmm. You know, that old Irish thing, you know? Yeah. And um, so it wasn't anything that I developed or I thought was different. But I was raised in a, um, a childhood that we pretty much were isolated from one another. You know, some families are like that. So no one just said, well, what's going on with you? So somehow there was just this internal world that was just always present. I was never frightened. I never thought it was different. Um, I never talked to anyone about it. So as time went on, um, probably in the middle, late 60s, when everything kind of hit, um, and I was introduced to Buddhism, which to me was meditation. And so just by opening to that consciously, then things began to really accelerate. 
And very quickly, I began to work with a couple of um, teachers that were quite beautiful, quite pure. I was very lucky to have that because there's a lot of misuse and misunderstanding. But they were very pure. And he could see, the, the husband could see that I probably could do that. So he just sit down with me and he said, um, just look in my field and I've got an issue here and I'd like you to look at it. I had no background, I didn't know anything about it, I had no training, nothing. I sit down and I just saw, and it was a significant injury in his knee, I saw what happened, I saw the uh, energetic um, uh, picture of how it was, um, the whole thing, it was just there. And so it became, it was very gradual. People would just say, well, I've got this. Can you look here? And then um, I just kind of stepped into faith and began to do it um, as, as also my work. So through the years, of course, and I did it for about 25 years, um, you refine it and you begin to see you know, deeper and more precise and, and more clearly. But it wasn't anything that I developed. It was just like, like being a painter. You've got a native ability somewhere. You're born with it. And then by doing it thousands of times, you get better it, at it. Yeah. it. You get better at it. But right before I um, met Anja, and I could see that it was help putting out fires, but it really wasn't deeply um, uh, bringing true healing. And so I just kind of put out this prayer. And then after I met Aja, what I started to do was I used that same skill. And then I looked into, and I could see where that being was consciously. Hmm. And I could see what was being held out. And I could see maybe how bringing consciousness to that, how that would really um, accelerate things. So that's how I sort of pointed it at this point. So when I do docusons, if uh, people are interested, I'll just tune in and I'll look at their field and I'll say, well, this is really awake and this is, you know, maybe some old belief here and if you'd look at that, this would help free that up and this is over here and, and it seems to, to be of benefit because it's very direct, you know, it bypasses the mind. So it's used into service of that at this point. And I very rarely, you know, unless someone really has an issue that they want to look at physically, then, you know, why not serve that? But it isn't the emphasis. Interesting. Um, do you have to be sitting in, in, um, in person with a person, or do you do them over Skype and things like that? Skype, phone, whatever. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Hmm, cool. it's, all, it's all one, huh? <laughs> and do you have to kind of turn it on and off, or do you, um, I, does this I happen all it, the time? I turn it on and off, yeah. and I'm really glad about that. Yeah, you're not like sitting in a restaurant scoping out all the people. <laughs> right. You know, and it's never been like that. It just was sort of, um, um, you know, once in a while I'll, uh, you know, I'll go to a grocery store or I'll walk past somebody and I'll get a download. Yeah. But it's just like a, a cloud or a, a you know energetic formation, and it just kind of moves through, and then that's it. Um, so I've always been very glad that I'm kind of a I'm very mechanical in a way. I just kind of turn it on, I look, give the information, it goes off. I'm very sensitive energetically, mm -hmm. you know, like you. I'm quite tuned in to transmission and darshan and. You know, very, very sensitive to that. In fact, that's what I tune into. Mm. And then the words are secondary. Um, but, um, no, I, I wouldn't want the burden of always it being turned on. Right. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't want to turn this into a sort of a party game kind of thing. And um, you may not feel it's appropriate, but do you feel like, since you've been talking to me for an hour, do you feel like saying a few things that would be appropriate for public consumption that would sort of <laughs> demonstrate that kind of uh, ability or insight? <laughs> we'll see. I'll see if I can check in, and I'll, if something's there, I'll share it with you. Okay. Hopefully something I won't have to edit out. <laughs>
I've been invited on all sorts of, you know, radio and all of that. And I'm, no, 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 I'll never do that. You have an interesting field. It's, um, it's quite vertical. And what I'm looking at is not so much, I mean, it's unique in, in that it's, you know, it's, it's this uh, body mind, but it's more like um, that that big picture, you know, the big view of, of of really who you are, and you have a very vertical channel, um, and Ver vertic vertical ver vertical is it's uh, I would say incarn you know and we'll we'll use the word incarnation. You can use the word dream. I don't care what you use, <laughs> and um, but I would say that just incarnation after incarnation after incarnation after incarnation. You have a line to that that is more of the of the spirit, and as you know, because you're very well read and you've got a brilliant mind, is that it was mostly separated out, right? It was in the transcendence. Mm -hmm. So you may be in the body and you may live, you know, on the earth, but usually it was separated out. You're in some kind of a monastery. Um, if the body was even uh, acknowledged, it was more. Um, to make it more able to sit for hours and hours and hours and years and years and years. So it wasn't really seen as a part of the whole. And so that vertical is the pure spirit. And so I would say that you probably came in with um, a, a pretty developed um, interest and uh, background uh, more towards that transcendence, the vertical, the 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 ground, the invisible, and it's it's um, quite um, um, whether it's conscious or not, and I assume that it is just by looking at your field. Um, that dark, that fundamental ground, it's it's quite it's quite awake. But what it is, it's defined. There's there's like a it's like this. And um, it's still within, um, oh, I would say, you know, do you know what the central channel is? You know, it's like the crown and then it's the interior mm -hmm. of the body. I think and, so. You mean like the whole chakra system and shushuma right. and all that? Yeah. And right, shushuma, you know, it's the central channel. Every, right. every religion and every intuitive, you know, sees the same thing. It's that, it's the, where the invisible comes into the visible. It's before the chakras, it's before the whole thing, right? So yours, it's, it's very developed. But for whatever reason, and um, when you're called uh, into this dream that we call life, it, 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 it draws itself back into wholeness and balance. So you're going to be drawn to looking at uh, you're going to be drawn into relationship. You're going to be drawn into the world in a certain kind of way, whether you want to or not. Mm -hmm. You're going to be drawn into looking at how is this um, lived and expressed because um, it wants to open up and it wants to include and it wants to um, experience everything. But the tendency and what you've come into it's a very um, quite developed. It's quite mature, but um, it stays within a certain parameter. So it wants to come into wholeness, but the tendency, I would say, would be that. So if there's any encouragement, it is to open consciously meditation, whatever it works for you, where you're undistracted and open to this very silent nature it's it's quite there for you whether it's totally conscious or not i don't know and then let it open up into space you've got the root you've got the ground but it hasn't quite opened all the way into the space you know there's this beautiful tibetan term and it's called awake space aware space or 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 Jesus you know it was the vertical which is the the godhead the spirit the pure spirit and then the horizontal which is the expression mm -hmm. 
you know, it's the divine mother, right? It's the substance. It's the holy, the holy uh, life. And um, in the middle is the heart. You know, of course, that's the awakened way in the body. So, um, if there could be just this emphasis for a little while of what is unbound, what is totally free, what is this the Tibetans call the pervading space. The sense is, it's all there for you, but this hasn't quite happened in the degree that will bring about that deep abidance, that deep sustained being. I think that's a good assessment. Um, uh, I mean, I've been meditating a couple hours a day for 44 years, but I always feel that, um, and there is, there is definitely an abidance, uh, you know, regardless of what's happening. You will, I, that's, that's apparent. Yeah, you know, falling off a bicycle, running through an airport, even trying circumstances, there's something that's in rock solid. But yeah. I, I always have the sense, and I articulate this all the time, um, in, as a general principle, but it also applies to me, that um, there is plenty of room for growth, you know, plenty of room for uh, uh, c greater clarity, expansion, embodiment, and um, and I can I relate to that. I can relate to that sort of lifetimes in monasteries bit because I actually did live in one this lifetime for a long uh -huh. time, yeah. and, and really resisted the idea of getting married and all because it seemed like it was a lesser dharma and so on. That's uh, right. And took a lot of adjustment, but um. But life did it anyway. Yeah, yeah. I, it like, was an intuitive sense that this is the way to yeah, go, even though all exactly. my friends were telling me I was crazy and stuff. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's obvious that that verticality is very deeply awake and quite present. And um, But, you know, it doesn't make sense to the mind because it sounds too simplistic, but there's just this quality of just opening vast in the horizontal mm. and then that great ground permeates everything without exception so when you say opening vast in the horizontal you don't necessarily just mean unbounded awareness you know <laughs> which one naturally settles into during meditation um, and is even there out of meditation but you mean more of a horizontal in terms of the relative field and of interaction and behavior and the objects? The space and that pervades everything. space that pervades everything. Uh -huh. And so again, if the tendency is to be a bit this, mm -hmm. then it's just open to the awareness to the exact opposite of that, and you'll begin to sense what's being pointed to. It's the pervading space. It's the you had a beautiful word, I don't remember what it was, the unbound. Unboundedness, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. but rather than that dark ground like here, the dark ground opens up as it is. Mm. That's interesting. You know, some people say that their experience is that, um, you know, they see everything as the self, everything as, the, as that unboundedness. And I had a long sort of, to do a you know, debate or discussion with Rupert Spira about this when I interviewed him, but um, I, I kind of really get the idea of unboundedness as my essential nature, um, not, not just an idea, but living that, but yes. in, in terms of um, apprehending everything around me as the self, I've, you know, there's tastes and glimpses, but it's not my living reality, um, right. and maybe that's what you're referring to here? That's what I'm referring to. Okay. That's, the, that's that shift. Yeah. And you're saying that what would facilitate that would just be a sort of a relaxing of some sort or a... And, and you're a master meditator, so that's why, you know, I think that's where your, your laboratory should be. Uh -huh. and, and just, it, it's an opening, uh, but it's a letting go that absolutely total letting go. Hmm. And you make that sound very voluntary, very willful in a way. I think it's possible. Uh -huh. Because you, you rec there's, there's a recognition here. That, that's what's required. Mm -hmm. And that's what is choiceless. It just, you know. But when that is open, then I, I think that it can be. It can be open to. It's just to be made conscious. And if there's a strong training 
And most monastery spiritual beings have a very strong training to keep it into the vertical. Hmm. Interesting. So, I think that one thing would be very beneficial for me also, and I'm not trying to make this all about me, but hopefully others will find it illustrative, is um, you know, spending more time in the presence of somebody like Aja, you know, having kind of more um, attunement or transmission opportunities. It's profound. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm surprised though how many miss, they don't even notice it. The transmission is like not even noticed. It's all about the words and it's all about, you know, the experience uh, that the words point out. Yeah. The transmission, of course, is what's making it all happen. Yeah. But yeah, I, you know, that classic, it's a very old Eastern pointer, you know, be with the master, mm -hmm. you know, just hang out with them. Did you ever read, um, uh, it was called The Chasm of Fire, and I think it's called Irma Tweedy. I, I mean, uh, it's definitely on my to-do list, but I haven't read it. It's, it's a beautiful because it's all about just the being in the, the proximity mm -hmm. of that that is so profoundly awake, and then it begins to move and burn in this very beautiful and quite dramatic way yeah. what it's not. It really does. I've had a couple of experiences... Um, both with Marishi and with Ama, you know, the hugging saint, where um, it, it's a couple, I mean, I've been with both of them a lot, but in a couple circumstances where I wasn't aware that they were entering the room, I was kind of like, yeah. um, and and all of a sudden this wave hit me. You yeah. Know, it's like, yeah. It's like, boom, this energy. Exactly. And then, and then oh yeah, they're here. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So yeah, you know, to be in that presence, it's so magnified and so amplified. That's their gift, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I've had the privilege just twice being with Ama. I mean, it was like, you know, it, I, you know, I can't even describe it. It's in the indescribable. Mm. So, but what I have also noticed, and I've talked with Joy about this because she'd spent so many years with her, that often people that are just strictly with that transmission, they don't always have the, the wisdom. And those on the wisdom path that get it all through the teachings, they don't seem to have the, you know, that, that awake transmission. So, you know, again, I mean, I adore my teacher, but I think he's quite rare in that both are there. Yeah, yeah. He's definitely got a complete package. He does, definitely has a complete package. So here, when I would sit with him, and it happened the first time, was... It would be the words I heard, and but they would just be like ripples on the field. Mm -hmm. There would just be this total isness. The transmission was what it was all about, mm -hmm. and then everything kind of happened within that. And um, and then I started to talk to other people, and you know it was all about the words, or they would be irritated about people's questions, or. Mm -hmm you know, whatever, and I thought, God, you know, <laughs> I'm not that at all. It was just this vast one. I think it's all important. I mean, just as we, all, we need food, we need air, we need exercise, we need this, we need that, because there's all these different facets of our makeup, and each one yeah. needs, its, needs its nourishment. Oh, absolutely. You, you know, in the field of spirituality, you have to have both. You have to have the, the, the knowledge and the experience, and, and one it's, without the other can get, definitely get kind of lopsided. Yeah. yeah. I, I certainly uh, feel that. I mean, some people, there was this beautiful, um, he was an Indian man, and uh, he was, I guess you'd call him a healer, I think it was just Darshan, and he, would, he said that there are those who follow the path of the sutra and those that follow the path of the direct transmission. Mm -hmm. But I agree with you. I think this is, this is wholeness, yeah. and, and both, both is, is required. It's interesting because you said early in the interview that you you alluded to people who seem to just have an understanding of this and and kind of mi uh, mistake that understanding for the the whole enchilada. Right. Mm. It's quite common. Mm. Or you know, for, for I couldn't see that it was even possible um, because if the truth would wake up, yeah, the essential shift would happen. The sense was that the truth then was prominent and it would take it all the way. It would be the guide all the way, right? There would be no co-opting and getting off and then starting to talk about 
the awakening. But what I observed is it happens much more than not. I'm sorry, I lost you a little bit there. What happens much more than not? There's this true and genuine essential yeah. shift of identity. Right. So what I thought would happen was then that would be the guide and it would lead all the way until there was this complete, whatever you want to call it, the seamlessness. Right. It doesn't happen very often. Mm. What mostly happens from what I've observed, and maybe this is just a phase, collective phase, is there's a certain recognition, it's genuine, and then somehow the mind grabs and says, this is it. Mm. I see. It's as far as this is going to go. Right. I'm home. Yeah. I've got the blue ribbon. <laughs> and it seems to be that. Yeah. I, I, and, and others, that's not a choice. Hmm. It just... I interviewed Mariana Kaplan a couple of weeks ago, and she's written a book about discernment on the spiritual path, and she has a chapter about the 10 most common spiritually transmitted diseases. <laughs> and, <laughs> oh, that'd uh, be a great book. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, I loved it. But, uh, number 10 was the I've got it disease, you know, the, the sort of tendency huh? for us, for people to, for some reason, um, you know, prematurely, I guess yes. pre premature immaculation is another phrase we can use here. <laughs> but to, pre <laughs> to, to prematurely assume that whatever awakening they've had is the ultimate, and to, I, I don't, I, I, we, we kind of talked it's a bit about why. It's a prevalent why disease. <laughs> <laughs> there was this rumor that went through Ajisanga, I don't know, four or five years ago. And I have no idea if he even said this or not, but you know how those rumors happen. And he said, you know, probably only about, I don't know, 50 out of five, I don't know, it was a very small number is going to take it all the way. And there was just chaos, you know, and of course everyone says, well, I'm not that, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm, it's choiceless for me, I don't have a choice. But, you know, that's when it first started to dawn that that essential shift is just the beginning. Mm. One of Amma's favorite phrases that she always says in, in talks is that it's good to always have the attitude of a beginner. Absolutely. And she's saying that to a, a mixed audience, so she's also implying you know, her most Absolutely. advanced people. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, it's in beginner's mind. Mm -hmm. Suzuki Roshi, you know, that's the most. Because it's fresh. It's only here, right? It can't be any different. And actually, in terms of the whole scale of things and what's potentially possible, um, I, I was, bro it was brought to my attention recently that in the Yoga Vasista they outlined 16 kalas, they call them, which are like levels of evolution. And uh -huh. hu humans supposedly occupy maybe numbers five through eight, you know, eight, know. Eight, eight being the greatest saints, and then there's, you know, eight, know. eight more above that. So if, we, if, if that's true, and if we think of it in that light, then, you know, we're all beginners relatively. We're all beginners. I mean, you know, you've been on the path a long time. And so you, at least when I was meditating and sort of trying to open, I didn't even know what enlightenment was. I just, I had this idea, it was union with God, that there was this presence, and I wanted to abide as that, right? So I didn't even have the idea of enlightenment much at all. But we were told that, you know, it wasn't going to happen. Then it was a very, 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 very rare thing. Uh -huh. So now it's in our common language. Everyone is getting a glimpse, Air, you know, that, that even just wants to sit still. So now then we've grabbed that, you know, it's like being teenagers, right? Now we know everything. And we think that, you know, we're hot, and we've got it, and we're this, and we're that, you know? Mm. And, um, yeah. maybe. <laughs> you remember what the voice said to Adu when he had his first awakening? Yeah. <laughs> he, said, he, said, he said, keep going. Keep going. Uh -huh. You know, the, the um, Heart Sutra, you know, beyond, beyond, beyond to the other shore. Mm. You know, that's a constant beyond, beyond, beyond. There's no place to land. Mm. There's no place to claim. There's no finishing point. 
there's another saying, I think it's from Zen, always being, always becoming. Yeah, right. Hmm. Yeah. Which, I mean, you know, this whole idea of give up the search and so on and so forth, you know, you can, I think there's, there's definitely truth to that. You, you arrive at a point at which that kind of gnawing, yearning, searching, desperate feeling dissipates and is gone. But it doesn't mean the the exploration or the adventure oh, is over. Not at all. You know, I, I think here, and this is this is this is interpretation. You may have a very different view, but the search is is very innocent, right? Mm -hmm. It's awareness that wakes up, and it begins to lead the life consciously. And but then again, very innocently, the tendency is to go away. So when the search is in, it ended is when the attention comes back to itself mm -hmm. and then the adventure really begins yeah that's the real deepening that's the way i understand it i mean i definitely went through years of sort of oh god you know get me out of this i gotta you know <laughs> yeah I, I mean, that's <laughs> just part of it yeah and, that, and that's not and if someone had said to me during that phase give up the search it would have been like saying to a hungry man well stop being hungry Right, you know, exactly. but, but once he's had some food, then you don't need to say that anymore. Right, exactly. <laughs> but the deepening, I think, just simply doesn't end. Mm, yeah. Beautiful. Well, we could probably sit here all day saying that over and over again. I, <laughs> I don't think it, you can say it too many times from too many different angles. It's, it's I think, a, a really valuable point for people to hear, which I, for some reason has made it a kind of a theme of these interviews. Um, well, I, that's why I was drawn to your interviews, mm. because you were talking about it, and many don't. Yeah, It's almost a little bit of a taboo, huh. and if you say that it's deepening, then you haven't got it yet, like I've got it. Right, you're like future-oriented <laughs> and, and stuff. <laughs> yeah. hmm. You have a lovely laugh. Oh, I like to laugh, yeah, thank yeah. you. That's great. Did you always laugh like this, or is it more of a post-awakening uh, <laughs> characteristic? I've always loved to laugh. Oh, that's good. <laughs> they call yeah. it um, free karma, right? Laughter is, is just totally free. Hmm. My husband, who studies all this stuff, there's also, is it 528 hertz, which is the, the resonant measurement Fre frequency? frequency. Ah. And, and that laughter is that. Oh, cool. I never heard that. Kind of cool, huh? Yeah, it's neat. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Well, this has been you, delightful. Yes? All you, you, you ask all your questions that you wanted to. I think so. I mean, I can, you know, I can, the way I'm wired, I could sit here all day dreaming up new ones. But I think, we, you know, after a while, I just get this feeling like, oh, okay, it's going to be a little redundant if I keep yeah. going now. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's been a delight. And, um, I, I really see what you're doing is really very beneficial and helpful, and um, so I'm glad I got to participate. Yeah, uh, I look forward to meeting you. You know, if we come out west or you come out east or something or other, we'll, we'll get together like, these days. I'd like that. Yeah. I'd like that. Thank you so much. Yeah, love, thank you. Love to you. I know oh. that's very non-dual, non but love to you. And to you. Love to you. <laughs>